what I'm talking about now. Now all I can see is chaos and confusion and panic. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here to speak to you about mainframes. So we are talking about these big black boxes inside the data center's corners. And uh, have anyone seen this kind of machine? Few hands, OK? Have anyone used this kind of machine? Still a few hands. OK. So you who raised hands might be familiar with the machine, but uh, uh, I will go through the basics today so everyone can get something about it. And going through the uh, memory areas, what the rocket uses, I guess it's nonsense at the moment. So quick facts. Most of the biggest bank in the world, and usually industry with the money are using these machines. One server can run a hell of a lot of transactions per day from the IBM marketing material. And I guess most of that actually is what they say. And the most securable machine on the planet. It was most secure machine on the planet since 2002. And uh, during that time and spring, Someone in Sweden noticed that, uh, oops, someone has used our machine three years, and we didn't notice it. And the breach was uh, found out when the guys leached the whole system through the FTP, and they were wondering why the hell our network is full of stuff. OK, what's mainframe? It has doors. Usually computers don't have doors. This has two. It's eptic based, not ASCII. ASCII is, you can transfer ASCII, but uh, it's not ASCII machine. Latest hardware, recent version number Z13. And uh, there is a new one coming, and the uh, number, number is not released yet, so it will be called Z next, as the latest version also was before this name. So 140 central processors which are taking care of the workloads. Also, there are other kind of processors, cryptographic processors, who take care of only for cryptography, and uh, disk management processors, which take about I.O., and stuff like that. Memory, there's a 10 terabytes. It's a full 64-bit system, so you can uh, address around, was it 18 terabytes or something like that in memory. Latest set OS version on the set OS system is 2.2. And uh, when you find out this install, these kind of installations, they can be hell of old. Source codes, what are in use, are written in late 80s, 70s perhaps. And they're still running. And the system is backward compatible also. From If you write today code for it, it will run next 30 years there. So operating systems, what are running in this kind of box? The biggest one, ZOS. And uh, it's uh, usually used, big banks and stuff like that. It's a main operating system. ZVM is uh, it's kind, of, kind of VMware for system Z. So you can have uh, multiple L bars, under L bar, and under L bar, and so on. There's, uh, guest operating systems under that. You can also run Linux, even natively, or through ZVM or KVM and so on. So that's also a new kind of workload what they are marketing at the moment. There's a smaller one machine called business class, what is meant for the Linux workloads at the moment. Okay. I'm a system programmer, not an administrator. There is no administrators on the mainframe. We are all system programmers. There are system programmers for DP2 and so on. <laughs> Address space, that's a kind of uh, di diamond 
or a program which is running long time in a memory. They just direct access system device, a storage device, sorry. So it's a disk. Class, in a RACF, there's, there are different kinds of classes where there are different kinds of resources. So you can have a, for example, facility resource, facility class, sorry. And there's a resource for OMVS stuff. And so, just to job entry subsystem, made in Houston. They launch a space shuttle with that. TSO, time sharing option. So it's an interface, human readable interface for system Z. And using that is a first time when you see a TSO, it's just a red ready prompt and nothing more. And it doesn't tell anything. ISPF front end to TSO. So some sort of a graphical interface then. So you can give a command through that and uh, you don't know, have to know every parameter for the command. OMVS, the left brain side of the system C or ZOS, it's a Unix cell in kind. It smells like Unix, tastes like Unix. Actually, it's kind of Unix, but it's not. It's OMBS. Languages that are available on the system is in, or ZOS, Assembler, naturally. JCL, job control language. What the, all the magic happens through this JCL? Rex, scripts. Yep. PL1, the old one. Old language, the uh, guys who can write that kind of language, they are probably dead or almost dead. <laughs> Same goes with the code. <laughs> okay, services what are running on the system. DP2, database services, big ones. CICS, it's kind of front-end front -end for transactions what are using the DP2 usually. WebSphere, so you can have a web, web interface to kicks and through that to the DB2. And uh, also there's uh, transfer protocols, FTP, SSH, and so on. FTP has been running in the mainframes since beginning. And about it, so I guess this is the point where the <laughs> interesting things start. <laughs> In short, by design, everything is no. <laughs> so there are system authorization facility which answers all the calls from the applications, and he, it asks stuff from RACF, which is a resource access control facility. Uh, it's a database for security settings for the set tools. There are also another program called uh, CA Top Secret, but uh, I haven't used it, never so I can say about it. And uh, here's the re request flow for a regular application request. So application user tries to access to a dataset, for example. So the request goes to the SAF. Can I access to this dataset? This is my user ID, this is the data set. So forward it to the RACF. RACF goes to the database, checks from the database, which is the most close definition for that data set. Wildcard or even a discrete profile. And it checks the accesses from there. And if the user or the, some of the user groups are in the access list, the most highest one is given. And the most highest one is none. Then comes read, control, update, execute, and alter in a different order. Though. And then the rocket answers to SAF, even 0, 8, or 4. Depends. Uh, 0 is yes, you can access. 8 is no, no way, you don't access it. And the 4 is I don't know. The different uh, resource is not defined. And depending on the rocket configuration, if there's a uh, Setup called protect all fail on. 
then the unknown resource means that there is no access. If there is a, that setting is on the warning, then the Rakef complains that I don't know this resource, but go anyway. And uh, if there is no protect all in effect, then the Rakef says, fuck it, you can, you can choose what you want. And then it depends on the application, what the reaction is in the end. Some applications give access, some don't. Okay, weak spots. What do you want to know in the mainframe when you find out what? Usually, TSO sessions are unencrypted. There's a possibility to run them on the SSL. But uh, most of the shops what I have seen are not running in the SSL. It's a plain text telnet communication. 3270, but it's in Eptic, so it might look like they're encrypted, but uh, if I remember correctly, in Wireshark, there's a button for the change the coding to Eptic automatically. Unix system services. That's a new link into the block, so-called, in a mainframe world. More and more services are going under that part of the OS. And uh, old Sys programmers are old farts, and they don't give a shit about the Unix. It's a pain in the ass in short for them. And they are not willing to learn it. They are giving us youngsters to do it. And uh, OK, that was it. <laughs> so Unix is like that. They are more friendly about the oh, good old ISPF editors and MVS side. Badly protected track of database is one weak spot. If you get into the system, and you can download the Rakef database, then you have all the security definitions in your hands. It's like a, having a, from the Linux box, you get the etc password, file, etc shadow, and all definitions from files and access bits from everywhere in one file. Then you can run it through and do what you want. But there are tools for it, how to analyze it and do stuff in the Rakef database. And the internet, that's a strange word for mainframe. Mainframe speaks, speaks SNA, not TCP IP. <laughs> but nowadays it has been but must to talk about TCP IP because of front ends with Nintendo's. <laughs> OK, another side of the coin. If the Sysproc is good, if it is real good, and he has a new good team and tools. Then all the weak spots are usually covered. So and there is no ETC password file in the ZOS, because all the de definitions are in the racket, including passwords and so on. And the other side, unprotected racket DP and protected racket DP. It can be configured so that no one can read the Rakef database, and it's running smoothly still. Just a few started tasks from the known place by known submitter can be run in system. And they can do, get a backup from the Rakef DB and put it in the safe place, even unencrypted it on the tapes. And these systems are usually in the, the darkest corner of the company network. Not on the front end, not from the, on the DMC. There are deep down. So, doing a penetrator, penetrator testing them for these kind of machines or trying to just break them up. What do you want to search? Usually, you want to run something inside. Then you want to find out the permission to submit things. All the stuff are run on the JCLs, and JCLs are meant for submitting jobs to just do which reserves the initiators, other spaces, disks, and so on, and then starts the job. And it runs in the system, and the result is something. If you don't have a permission to, job, to submit anything, there's nothing to do. Even, you can't even log into the machine. 
because you are our one long-running job in the system. User ID is with the high authority, special operations auditor. I would take operations for a user ID if I want to break the system. Because operation user can read everything, but is not denied from him, especially. If the user ID has a permission none, just for the user ID given, then he can't access. But if he is not on the access list at all, with the operations attribute, he can read everything, or copy it, or overwrite it, and so on. APF authorized libraries. That cloud library gives you a permit going to supervisor state. So if your program is in there, you can do anything. It's like pulling the rabbits from the hat. Poor config. Some system programmers, they just want to get job done. So the address space is running finally. No error messages on the screen, but the security is forget. No one has to even think about security, how to take care of it. What, are, what the users can get when they log on to the system. Usually they get everything, especially on the web services. That kind of stuff, what to look for. Tools for looking for that. Why should you learn to use MVS? If you can find out the administrator or this programmer who do it for you. Ask, ask the guys how to do it the JCL, but copy the Rakef database, but not so directly. They will do it if you ask nicely and uh, put it in the nice package the request. Much more easier. User MVS guys are, they look like antisocial, and, but uh, after a little chat, a couple of beers, they, they just want to be proud of their systems. So you can get a lot of inf information out from those guys. John the Reaper, okay, tool mentioned. It supports Legacy DP2, uh, Rocket DP encryption. What is this with a couple of tickets? forward in the, in the password. But nowadays, there are also KDFIs available as an encryption method. Uh, shops are taking that in place at the moment, and uh, John doesn't support it yet. I guess the support will come someday. And uh, that's right, TN3 TN to 70 client is what you need when you want to interface the mainframe with the old way through the TSO and ISPF panels and stuff like that. Manuals are also good help, because if IBM has a, they usually do so that everything is in manuals. There are thousands of pages, manuals available just for the networking, for example. Also, there are red books, how to do things, how to protect stuff, and how to install it, how to take it in use, and so on. That's all in the manuals. Okay. Now you get in the system, you did what you want, but this thing is good for getting traces for everything. There's a facility called system management facility. It's for logging only. It logs in short, everything. Every command that you give, every data set you touch, everything. When you did it, what, re what re protection resource you used for it, and so on. And also, it's a good in alarming. It starts yelling when you touch something where you su don't suppose. So there are um, quite many main types where it writes. Usually those records are split into multiple data sets and then through to the tapes to save this space. Because this is expensive, as the old fart said. Two times kind of locking systems, lock streams or man files. Man files are older ones, so there's a little bit difference in the technique how they do it, but they, 
stuff inside the files is safe. If you find out a user ID or your user ID has a uAudit on, don't do anything stupid, because then you are into more strict supervisor. So even if there are stuff that are not locked by default, with uAudit attribute, it's still locked. So there are permissions like universal access. It gives permission to do something to everyone, including anonymous users who the MVS or Rakev doesn't know. UAudit attribute locks that use also. So be careful. Auditor attribute, in case, is a totally different thing. With that, you can change the audit attributes in the Rakev system. So you can take the audit bits off or set it something else. Even harder it, and uh, if you put the audit bit in the wrong place on with the wrong parameter, it fills out the SMF and uh, creates different kinds of problems. Fills disks and tapes and gets those old files running around in the office. So, ways to do testing or learning. Hercules. System Z emulator in short. You can get it from the web shop near you in Sweden, where the other students get their applications. There was a 1.10 version available, if I remember correctly. Grab the manuals from the IBM site and install the system. Or bang there. And if it doesn't work, start over. Other way is to find out the job as a sys programmer. That's what I did. And the profit parts comes late. It usually takes about the three years to get hang of a hang of what the old guys are saying or talking about. First year is you get a couple of acronyms, but you don't know what they mean. And second year you can use start using them, those acronyms, and you still don't know what they mean. I've been using this stuff, uh, doing this stuff eleven years now. Now I know what I don't know. I don't know shit about it. <laughs> so resources for going on. Red books are found from the IBM site. Manuals also from the IBM. And a friendly list of Rakev fellows. There are all kinds of discussions. Newbies, old farts, they're all in the same place. That's the bar where we are. So. Welcome to come there and ask questions. So, all right. Questions? Anyone? So, how would I access the Rakef DB? How would you access a Rakef DB? Mine? Mm, no. <laughs> you don't get access there. <laughs> because even I didn't, don't have access there. If I have access there, and in case you get my access to there, or my user ID, then you have access there. And my system is compromised. So then I don't have access there. I don't need access there. Any other? If no, I thank you for your time, and I have a nice evening.